Good morning. I want to try something as we begin here. I want you to either take your own Bible or grab a Bible from the pew right in front of you and put it in your hand. Uh, just put your hand on it. Lay your hand on it. Now that you've done that, I want, to, I want us to pray together. Father, we are not invincible. We are not as strong as we think we are. But like Jesus, we need to learn to live by every word that comes from your mouth. Every promise that you have given to us. And so by your word this morning, teach us. Teach us through your Holy Spirit and lead us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. So keep that Bible handy. We're going to use that in just a few minutes. Uh, this week, I came across a website called Hope Again, a place where people shared story after story of really tough stuff going on in their lives. And it's an outlet for their pain uh, for those of all ages, including many teenagers who, who posted on there. For example, Sarah wrote, after school, I heard a knock at the front door and I'd been playing with my niece. And so I opened the door laughing to see a woman there. She started saying my mom's name, and I quickly shrugged off her saying whatever she said. And, and I said, oh, my mom isn't here right now. If you'd like to leave a card or something, I can let her know that you stop by when, when, you get back, when she gets back. The woman stared at me for a moment before repeating my mom's name and then asking if I knew her. And so I said, yes, she's my mom. And I looked at her wondering why she was asking so hard about my mom. And she asked if another adult was there. And I informed her it was just me, that I was the best adult that she was going to get. So she sighed and started speaking. And at that moment, I felt this ringing in my ears. I could hardly hear her words. I stared for a moment before asking her to repeat herself. And she looked back at me and she said, Your mom, unfortunately, was in a car accident this morning. And she passed away. Another young person, Mary, wrote, My grandma, who was like a second mom to me, just passed away from cancer that was spreading very quickly. It was in her brains, it was in her lungs, her liver. Her chemo wasn't working, that, and so she started hospice just a few weeks ago. It was really hard to wrap my mind around her passing. It just didn't feel real. She loved anyone and everyone unconditionally. She's the person that would make me laugh, make me feel special, and help me during the hard times. And she would give me advice. I already miss her so much. And there are countless stories on this website and on many other websites too from people just like us who have gone through things like you've gone through. And the question often comes to mind, where's God? Where's God when it hurts? Do you ever feel like God may have abandoned you? That somehow he must have overlooked your situation? Maybe, hasn't, maybe God hasn't understood or he's forgotten about you and your pain. And time and time again, you've tried giving your situation over to God in prayer, but then you wonder if he really listens. Days, turns in, days turn into weeks, um, months go by, even years, and at best your prayers seem to have landed in the hands of this powerless God who at best has done nothing to help you. Where do you turn? What do you do now? Feelings of anger may come. Emptiness might well up inside of you. Thoughts of hopelessness appear. Life hurts, doesn't it? It's so unfair at times. And you ask yourself, why must I, as a child of God, endure such hardship and pain? And again, you, you reach out and you state your case to God. God, where are you? Life hurts right now. Your doctor discovers a disease and it has serious implications on your health or potentially on someone close to you that you love. We have a few people here at Trinity going through that right now. This is reality for them. You know people personally. Life hurts. God what are you going to do about this situation? Your job's so stressful. It's been stressful for a long time. It's ruining your life. You think if this is what rolling out of bed for me is going to mean uh, from this time on, then I'd just rather not wake up. Life hurts. God, how long? Lord, you know that my teen struggles in school. My, my elementary school student uh, can't keep up with, the, with, the, with what they're learning. They get picked on. Can't you help her find just one good friend? God, where are you? These are questions that even people of God ask sometimes. For instance, listen to these words from Psalm 13. Hear the writer David, who's king of Israel, who has everything the world could offer him at his disposal, all the resources. He prays, how long, O Lord? 
Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and every day have sorrow in my heart? As you consider David's words, the fact is all of us, everyone in this room, encounters times, seasons of hurt and despair. And I want you to reflect on this question. What ongoing pain do you carry in your life this morning? Where do you feel despair? Where do you feel disappointment with life and need God's help today? And if you're comfortable, uh, hopefully you have a bulletin inside their space to write that down. Write down what that is. Just be honest, honest with God. This is where I'm experiencing feeling despair, disappointment this morning. Many of you I know have felt this way before. You've given your plea over to God in prayer again and again, desperate for help and wonder why there seems to be no answer. Or it's possible that in your heart you sense that God has answered your prayer, but his prayer, but his answer appears to be no, or at least not now. This can create some serious tension because how do we reconcile this God that we worship every week who loves us but apparently comes up short at times when he doesn't meet our request? Why does God delay fixing things that he could do today? And so each of these questions raises a direct challenge to God's character. Is there something deficient about God that we're just not seeing? Maybe he's not all that we hoped him to be. These are challenging waters for us to navigate, not just uh, anybody, but especially as Christians. The good news is we're not the first of God's people to ask these sort of questions. So if you have your Bible, hopefully it's still in your hand, I want to invite you to open to Isaiah chapter 40. Turn to verses 27 uh, 31 to 31. If you'd like to use the church Bible, it's on page 756. Isaiah chapter 40. God's word doesn't cover up difficult questions. It, it doesn't pretend that they don't exist. Instead, it brings them to the surface, helps us understand God's faithful presence in the midst of uncertainties. Uh, Pastor Nathan, as he came off renewal uh, just several weeks, about a month ago, he was reflecting on these verses uh, as he returned. And we're going to dig in even deeper here this morning. So listen as I read uh, from Isaiah 40, starting at verse 27. Why do you say, O Jacob, and complain, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord. My cause is disregarded by my God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God. He is the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary. His understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and he increases the power of the weak. Even youth grow tired and weary. Young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Now look back at verse 27. Here, the God of Israel, or as he's often referred to, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He has not met the expectations of his people. They have poured everything into him, a monotheistic God. They've poured everything in him. The trustworthy God of their forefathers has not lived up to their liking. And he's portrayed as being absent, uh, void, uh, uninterested, uncaring of their condition. His character is being called into question. Listen again to what is said about him. My way is hidden from the Lord. My cause is disregarded by my God. Now that is just an outpouring of someone's heart there. And so they start to wonder why worship a cold and distant God who withholds compassion from his people. Uh, this verse captures the very same thoughts that echo in a lot of our minds, of people's minds today all over the world, especially during painful, difficult events like hurricanes and the destruction that they cause. Keep praying for those down south that were so directly impacted. Their lives have been turned upside down. Um, I'm not able to show you a picture. It didn't come up. But if you could see Asheville, North Carolina. Do you know how far inland Ashland, uh, Asheville, North Carolina is? And yet it was just submerged in water. Um, just the other day, somebody was telling me that a river that runs up to a dam was was just plugged up because there was furniture and debris, couches, people's belongings, just plugging it all up, just devastated, not just Asheville, but one of so many towns, so keep praying. In other trials, like illness, like Jolene Gaskill, who has shown such great courage and has been fighting this battle for over a year now, 
keep praying for her. It's such a battle. So many of us, when we face unexpected, frustrating challenges, when pain just floods our lives, it's these kinds of things that sap our strength. They, they wipe us out, not just physically, but emotionally, mentally, spiritually as well. But in the midst of our fear and our uncertainties, when darkness comes in, when, when doubts overwhelm us and our world's caving in, God has always raised up people, in this case, raised up prophets at just the right time to proclaim the truth of his character and to give us this assurance of God's eternal presence and help. So in our scripture today, the prophet Isaiah, he's the one during this time who carried this torch. In verse 28, Isaiah says, Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God. He is the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary. His understanding no one can fathom. It's as though Isaiah is standing on a mountaintop. He's yelling as loud as he can with a megaphone to anyone who will listen. Haven't you heard? Before time began, God was there. And when this world ends, God will be. He exists apart from time, outside of time. He's entered our time. Time cannot hold him. He doesn't wear a watch. He doesn't need an alarm clock to wake up to things that happen. God created time, and when he chooses, he can end time. And as the creator, the eternal God gives life and purpose, and he gives beauty to all that he has made in his time. The ends of the earth are his. Some of you, I grew up singing this beautiful song. I love children's songs because they're so memorable. Uh, and you remember this powerful one. He's got the whole world in his hands. And the words of that song remind us that we can trust God. No matter what happens in life, no matter what we go through, there isn't a place where God is not there. He holds us. He holds the whole world in his hands. And since he's not bound by time, since he's not limited by resources in any way like we are, his strength will never wane. And so it's a good reminder when you and I face troubles in life, this little children's song, it's not that God doesn't understand. It's not that, uh, or doesn't feel the reality of our pain. In fact, the exact opposite is true. God knows pain as much as any one of us. But in our small, our limited, earthbound perspective of seeing things, we fail to understand him. We fail to see him and his ways at work. And so scripture reminds us that even when we don't understand, God is up to something. He's got the whole world in his hands. Isaiah 55 verse 8 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my way, your ways my ways, declares the Lord. So we don't always know what God is up to in any given moment or season of life, but we can trust him. And knowing this, shouldn't we, as one commentator has said, shouldn't we consider the absurdity of losing our faith in the one who in relationship to the earth and to our lives is all powerful, he's all wise, dominant, with no other God that could challenge him, check him, or, or rival him. King of kings, and he's sovereignly in charge of this world down to the smallest detail, so that everything is in its place. Nothing is overlooked. Nothing is lost. God sees it all. And so from our eyes, from our glasses that we wear, wear this world doesn't make sense because it's broken. It suffers from sin's curse, as you have all experienced as Genesis, the first book of the Bible, so clearly explains, there's confusion everywhere. There's pain everywhere. But God's presence is what changes everything. Through Jesus Christ, God brings hope out of suffering. He is ultimately going to heal us from the pain that we endure. So my next question for you to consider is this. Do I trust God with the difficulties in my life? Do I trust God with the difficulties in my life? Now, having captured the promise of God's presence, you're probably wondering, what good is that? What good is it that if I still don't know why God hasn't lifted the burdens in my life? Certainly, God could heal every hurt, any hurt, at any given moment, every time we express a need, but he doesn't do that. Why? I'm not sure, and I bet you don't know either. I suspect some of it has to do with our free will that God has given us. Some of it has to do with problems we create, trials that we go through, we cause on our own. In other situations, God might be opening our hearts so that we can hear him more clearly. 
I know C.S. Lewis describes pain as God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world, to get our attention, to draw us near. So like you, I have ideas, but I certainly don't have all the answers. Our ways are not God's ways. But what I do know is that the promise given in verse 29 is put there already assuming that our struggle is real and our struggle exists. It says, God gives strength to the weary and he increases the power of the weak. Isn't that amazing? This verse is critical to our understanding of God and who he is. Let me read that one more time. God gives strength to the weary. You've been there. And he, gives, he increases the power of the weak. Now say to yourself, or say out loud, I am weak. I am weak. And if you believe that, if you're willing to admit you have limitations, if you're willing to admit I have weaknesses that I have no resources for, that makes you a good candidate to receive God's strength. Embrace your weaknesses. Embrace your weaknesses. Count them as a value. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the Apostle Paul, he struggled with what he called a thorn in the flesh, a weakness, a limitation, a deep, painful burden that he carried in his life. Some think, some think that it may have been a really difficult uh, health problem that went on for a very long time. Others mentioned it may have been temptation of some kind. Starting with verse 8, Paul wrote these words. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, Paul's response was, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in my weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, and in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And I think Paul must have learned something about what it means to to rely on God and to grow in faith and to mature and persevere through his weaknesses and struggles. When you acknowledge your weaknesses and you embrace the reality of your trials, you, have, you will have taken in this world the biggest, most difficult step towards yielding yourself completely to God's strength. Because our human condition really is such that we are frail, no matter what anyone else might tell you. Even the most healthy, physically strong, picturesque person you see on TV or on the cover of a magazine, the most uh, self-confident, educated person is no match whatsoever for the fallout in this world. Don't think that you're beyond the need of God's strength. We're all just one trial, one knock at the door, one phone call, one an anticipated moment in life away from crumbling. And so Isaiah says in verse 30 that even youth, even those that you look at as strong, fast, durable, they grow tired and weary. Young men stumble and fall. You and I weren't made to shoulder the weight of the world on our own. I don't watch the news very much, and I'll tell you why I don't watch the news, because it puts a burden on me I cannot bear. I do try to catch up and keep up with what's going on a little bit, but I don't know if God meant for us to know all the bad things going on from Harrisburg all the way across to Australia and China. I can hardly bear that burden. I don't know how long, uh, I don't know how long some of you have tried, uh, but I'd guess a few of you are slumped over right now with aches from trying to bear the weight of just your own life, let alone the world itself. Here's a helpful tip for us, something that's very practical that you can do. Everyone needs someone. Everyone needs someone. You can benefit from being part of a small group, a study, guys, uh, women of couples. You can benefit from having a prayer partner or a discipleship mentor or a coach or whatever. You need someone close that you can talk to, that you can bear your heart with, where you can pray for one another. Bury this idea that you can make it on your own. Just not gonna happen. We're not meant, we're not made that way. Dare to be real. Share your struggles, your limitations, because others have them too. We all need close friends to walk with, where we say, hey, say, this is what I'm dealing with. Would you pray for me? And the other person's like, this is what I'm dealing with. Would you pray for me? Encourage one another and pray together. One of the most practical steps you can take in all of your life. 
So here's another important question for you to think about. How do you feel about your weaknesses? How do you feel about them? Maybe the words frustrated come to mind. Maybe the word bitter comes to mind. Why do I have to deal with this? I don't see them dealing with this. Maybe it's anger. That's how a lot of us feel, frustrated, bitter, angry. Most of us struggle to be honest with ourselves, let alone with others. Be honest. To admit weaknesses makes us feel vulnerable, but maybe that's the point. Maybe that's the point, to get past ourselves and receive God's help. Who knows, in time, your weaknesses might reveal and you might actually develop the perspective that they prove to be diamonds. It takes time to see the value of a diamond, of what pressure, perseverance, and the right cuts by the master might do in life, in marriage, through tragedy, through loss, missteps, potholes, broken dreams that you've held on to. God works best when we are like clay, when we can be shaped for his purposes through our weaknesses, which means God can redeem your pain. And that's what Isaiah is talking about. God will redeem your pain. Maybe like Paul, at some point, we'll see that our weaknesses, our hardships, our difficulties have eternal value in God's kingdom, even when it's hard for us to see and understand. Is it possible that your struggles could actually be a blessing? Could God flip them and everything that you count as a hindrance and a wall in your life? could be a blessing from God. Now let's look at this last verse. Verse 31, it says, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. There are two things here that I want to point out to you. That word hope is so powerful and it's synonymous with a lot of other words such as wait, trust, anticipate, patience. And the word renew in the Hebrew literally means to exchange. In other words, this verse claims that if we wait patiently on God, if we trust him, his promise is to take our weaknesses and exchange them for his strength. That's exactly what Paul did. If you release your trials to God, he will hold you in his arms. Even even in some of life's most painful circumstances, God will sustain you. For For whatever reason, God may choose not to remove your burdens, but his strength will be enough. I wrestle with this every single day. I've been through trials. Many of you know that. I've watched so many of you walk through trials, holding tightly to God, asking questions, tragedy, accidents, sickness, loss. I see you impacted, being impacted by the heartbreaking choices of those that you love. You you didn't have anything to do with it. You're just watching friends, family members make choices, and it's causing you great pain in your life. I see your faith. And what it does for me, it gives me courage. And we learn from watching each other reach out and grab hold of the hand of God and live by faith and strength in the darkest of times. Isn't that a powerful illustration of this passage? We learn from each other's faith. That's why we need each other. You know, it's our struggles that unlock our desire to experience God's strength. Why else would we care? Really, why else? It's his grace to help us connect with him more deeply. And when we do, here's the picture that Isaiah gives us at the very end of verse 31. When your hope, and remember that is such an important word, when your hope is in the Lord, God renews your strength. Hope allows you to soar on wings like eagles, to rise above your trials. And sometimes that's exactly what we need. We need to rise way above what we're seeing so that we can look down and see a broader picture. So that we can see something more than, you know, the, the, small, the smaller your world gets, the more closed in you become if you don't reach out to God. You see life and challenges from above from a perspective that you wouldn't otherwise know apart from God's strength. Another thing about hope, hope in the Lord helps you run and just keep on going when the, when the race is long and brutal and tired. Who wants to run a marathon? Who's crazy enough to do that? And I know some people sitting here have done it. Hope in the Lord helps us do that so that you don't become weary and quit. And most importantly, hope helps you walk through the daily grind of life, day after day, and not faint and not fall over. If I was the one running a marathon, I'd be looking around for an exit 
to get out of that race and to get help. I can't tell you enough how important it is to spend time with God each day. There's a big difference between walking with God and just living. Huge difference. To simply live is to just uh, keep on you know, tackling life as it comes your way unexpectedly. But to walk with God means to walk with anticipation. Walking through your week in reality that some things are going to go well and some things aren't. And to invite him in every facet of it. To invite his strength, his power, and to help you uh, in it all. Paul writes in Galatians, this is a great phrase. If you don't know this phrase already, write it down. He says that we are to keep in step with the Spirit. Do you know in your life what it means to walk through each day and keep in step with God's Spirit? It's, it's about laying down our will and living according to His will and trusting in His power and strength, faithfully walking with God through each day, each step. In Genesis chapter 5, there's this long list of people, it says, who lived many years and then died. But then it mentions Enoch, who didn't just live, but he walked closely with God until God just took him away. And I can't say that's going to happen to any of us. I would like that to happen with me. I'm just walking with God, and God just poof, takes me away, and it's all cool, you know? But it's a great way of describing what we should do, that we are eternal beings who are meant to, designed to, walk closely in step with God until he takes us to be with him. And it's more than just we live and we die. It's living according to his spirit, walking with God every day. It's life with God here and now and into the future, preparing ourselves for heaven and being with him eternally. Micah 6, 8 says, He has showed you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Ask yourself this question. Am I walking closely with the Lord this morning? Am I walking with him so that I can put myself in a position to receive his strength? Those who walk closely with God didn't get there without having their faith tested by fire. The Bible tells us story after story of godly men and women who emerged from their trials, who went through fire, and they came out stronger and they prevailed to glorify God through their lives. And that can be your story. In fact, for many of you sitting there, that is your story. And you are a testimony for others, an encouragement to them. If you have a close walk with God, you can do that. And you can trust God to renew your strength day after day after day until he takes you home to be with him. And so if you're questioning God's care for your life this morning in all that you've been through, I invite you to put your trust in him again. I invite you to take the promises of his word and receive in exchange for whatever weaknesses you have, his strength. And through every struggle, let God refine your faith on the hard anvil of life. Say, God, whatever reason you have me going through this now, refine me, purify me in the fire, teach me, grow in me the character of Jesus Christ. Help me to become all that you intended me to be and help lead me through this and he will do it. As we prepare to take communion this morning, I want us to think now about Jesus Christ, our Lord, our King. The night before his death, he prayed in the garden, like we've prayed, Lord, if it's possible, take this cup from me. Take this burden away from me. He was feeling so weak. He was struggling. He knew the pain that he would endure. Look at the rose window above. It's, it's a reminder to us week after week after week. And then he said, but not my will. Yours be done. And while hanging on the cross, suffering for our sins, listen to the words he cried out because you've cried them, maybe not using these same words. My God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? Jesus understands. Jesus endured incredible pain. In the most grueling way, he died. But he did it because he saw the future at hand, the strength and healing that his death, his life, and his resurrection would hold. He fulfilled the promise to help us overcome sin, hurt, weakness, trials, challenges, difficulties of all kinds. The cross is a symbol of his love and power. The resurrection is evidence of his power and that he is with us now. And his word stands forever. And as Christians, we draw strength from the power of his sacrifice to heal us, to give you victory. And we too will spend eternity with him just as he is in eternity now. So I don't know if you know this or not. Not everybody does. But today is Worldwide Communion Sunday. All over the world, from Lancaster County uh, to other parts of the world, we are sharing this sacrament 
with the, with the church, the big C church and Christians all around the world who are doing the same thing that we are doing. We are remembering the sufferings of Christ and we are celebrating uh, the healing that he has brought into our lives through his wounds. So as we prepare to take communion together this morning, if you believe, if you put your faith in Jesus Christ and you've received God's forgiveness for your sins, you are invited to share in this sacrament. Maybe you've never done that before. Maybe you're hearing God's word this morning and it's speaking to you for the first time and you're thinking, I need this God in my life and I need him right now. That's what God does. He shows up when we need him and he appears through the person of Jesus Christ who lived in a difficult world like ours. So if you're here today and you need to put your faith in Jesus Christ, would you pray with me? God, before we come to the communion table today and we recognize the body and the blood that was shown on the cross that you bore to heal us, to forgive our sins, we invite you to renew in us your spirit once again. And for anyone here this morning who's hearing this for the first time or have heard it but it never spoke to them, God, I pray that you would come into their heart as they ask you to do that. I pray, God, that you would forgive their sins as they ask you to do that. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would live inside of them as they ask you to do that. May your will be done in their life this morning. So as we prepare to take communion together, if you have believed and received God's forgiveness in your sins, you're welcome to partake. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the strength that you've given us in your son, Jesus Christ, for your unfailing love and sacrifice for our good and our forgiveness. Lord, as believers, as a church, we celebrate the joy and the life that we have in you. Even though life is hard and life hurts, you have revealed through the power of your resurrection the victory and the hope that we need to overcome every struggle. So God, for us this morning, whether it's sin that's eating away at us, if it's trials of some kind, our hope remains steadfast in you because we know that the same power that raised Jesus to life has given us the power of new life. And so encourage us as we receive the bread and the juice this morning with the strength and the hope that we have in you that Isaiah prophesied about. For these and every gift from above, we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Our communion will be brought to you this morning, uh, so please wait until everyone has received and then we'll take it together. And also for the cup, once everybody has received it, we'll take it. So would those who are helping or serving in some way with communion come forward, please?